welcome back to ICENTD Climate and Health. This is uh, the first conference by the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases on climate and health and kind of the linkages and the evidence uh, on the impact of climate on diseases and particularly tropical diseases. Uh, we've had two really fascinating days, um, six sessions so far exploring everything from the basic science, um, impact of climate on vectors and on parasites, but also uh, all the way to the other spectrum, advocacy in these fields and also methodologies of um, how do you break down the silos uh, between the field of climate and the field of health. And I think the message that's been really clear throughout this, all these sessions and these two days and the wonderful presentations we've heard from colleagues around the world is that the field of tropical health has a major part to play when it comes to mitigating or responding to the climate crisis. Um, and so to conclude this really exciting and important event and all the discussions and, and the thoughts that we've been exploring all along, we really wanted to put the focus on, on the field of tropical diseases as a major stakeholder um, in climate. And so it's my great pleasure um, to welcome to this final panel and our five fantastic speakers who will be taking us through all these various aspects of how can we respond and how can we be a, a, a really important part of responding to the climate crisis, whether that be in terms of R&D, whether that be in terms of vector control innovation, uh, whether that be in vector repellents, um, and just more generally as part of a humanitarian response uh, when an extreme climate event happens. So without any further delay, I'd like to welcome very warmly our speakers. First and foremost, we'll be hearing from Dr. Somia Iktadar. Somia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. We've spoken a few times at an ICENTD event. It's always a real pleasure to have you here. Um, uh, you are assistant professor at the King Edward Medical University in Pakistan, and you're also with the Dengue Expert Advisory Group, the DIAG in Pakistan. So thank you. Yeah, but you have the old introduction. I've been promoted to the head of department and associate professor. That, well, okay. Congratulations then. I take this opportunity. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, so it's a great honor. And then we will also hear from Dr. Prasad Lina Yagi. Welcome, Prasad. Hi, Sonia. Thank you for the introduction. Hi. Thank you for joining us. You are representing the National Institute of Health Sciences uh, in Sri Lanka, and you'll be talking to us about uh, the relationship between El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, and Aedes vector activity. We look forward to that. A very warm welcome as well to Dr. Emma Maynard. Hello, Emma. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. So you're from the Wellcome Trust based here in London, and uh, we heard a lot from your colleagues already from your very exciting work uh, individually and as an organization in this. And talking to us about uh, insect repellents and preventive side of tropical uh, diseases in terms of climate change. It's uh, a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Delali Manto, representing Merck. Hello, Delali. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to have you here. And finally, to talk to us a little bit more about R&D and uh, developing therapeutics for climate sensitive neglected diseases and some of the challenges that this represents. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Kishore Hassan. Hi, Kishore. Hi, nice. Uh, thank you for having me. Pleasure. Thank, uh, thank you for joining us at this ungodly hour for you, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's a little early in the morning here, but that's okay. Oh gosh, that's what I call dedication. <laughs> Um, you're co-director and co-founder of the Neglected Global Diseases Initiative based at the University of British Columbia. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Pleasure. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand over the floor to our speakers. And first and foremost, we'll be hearing uh, from Dr. Somia Iktadar, who'll be talking to us um, about going from, from extreme climate to public health in a crisis 
and the impact of the devastating floods in Pakistan earlier this year. Thank you very much. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all the audience who are in different parts of the world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, water is the driving force in the nature. It's the lifeblood of humanity. Um, our nations, our economies, and our well-beings, they all are, you know, somehow dependent on water. And water is a sign of life. It's a sign of love. It's a sign of happiness. But some Sometimes, whenever there is extreme of anything, then this becomes a crisis. And this is exactly what happened in Pakistan this year, when there was excess of rainfall in different parts of the country, leading to flooding all over the province, especially in provinces of Pakistan. Saying there were a lot of flooding, and because of the unprecedented, uh, a lot of catastrophic. I am going to talk to you from extreme devastating floods in Pakistan. Um, as mentioned by Marian, my name is Dr. Somia, and I am currently heading the Department of Medicine at King Edward Medical University. I've been associated. Uh, with Dengue Expert Advisory Group for a very long time, and I've chaired it previously, and I look after the infectious diseases, and I'm also the founding secretary general of Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. And it's an extreme pleasure to be here on this climate and health uh, conference webinar today to talk about uh, some of the effects of climate change and which we have experienced because of unprecedented heavy rains during the year's monsoon, which have caused massive destruction. So this massive destruction and this unprecedented downpour is actually because of the climate change. The severe heat wave followed by 30 years of record-breaking rains and glacier lake outburst flood contributed to water levels which rose in the dams and rivers and ultimately resulted in floods. And this has been labeled as the world's deadliest flood since the 2020 South Asian floods that you remember. And another contributing factor for worsening the floods in Pakistan has been the deforestation. And Pakistan is the eighth worst affected by climate change phenomena despite the fact that it's contributing only 1% to the global greenhouse gas emission. So the major affected areas, as I told you, that it's, it's a widespread uh, calamity and it is mainly involving most of the parts of the country. But there are three provinces, Balochistan, Sindh and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which are more affected and more than uh, a dozen districts are affected in KPK, about 23 districts in Sindh, and 32 districts in Balochistan. There are floods in other provinces as well, but they are not so severe. So uh, giving you the idea of Pakistan, we have five provinces, Sindh, Balochistan, Punjab, KPK, and then there is AJK, which is Azad, Jammu, Kashmir. And there is a region which is known as a Gilgit and Baltistan region. And if you can see, there are more than 71,000 families and, and 0.5 million uh, right holders in 27 districts which are affected by this flood. Now I'm going to share some of the facts and figures with you about how many people are displaced, how many had to be migrated, and what is the effect in cases uh, in these districts in the public health sector. So this is the situation in many of the parts of the country right now where you can see that they are flooded entirely. The houses have been destroyed completely, that have been wiped out. The infrastructure of roads and healthcare facilities is destroyed. And people are now living in camps um, as migratory colonies are formed by different NGOs and government sector. So this is the sad state of affairs that we are 33 million people. They are affected due to this calamity and about 7.9 million people are displaced. And we've been able to accommodate majority in the relief camps, but we have lost many people within around 
1,717 casualties and about 13,000 injured people. And apart from the loss that we have in the in the form of land and everything, the healthcare facilities in, uh, which are catering to these uh, these towns and these flood affected area, which is about around 2,000 health facilities, they've also been damaged during this calamity hit. So the effects of flood can be manifold. You all know it can affect our economy, it can affect our people, it can affect you know, the general um, well-being of the patients, depreciation in economy, it can lead to inflation, it leads to in unemployment and poverty rate. And this flood has caused a major, major damage to our economy in the, in the form of estimated damage worth of about 40 billion US dollars, 2.1 million houses damaged, 4.4 million acres of crops and orchards damaged, and schools and healthcare facilities have also been destroyed during this calamity. And this has become the talk of the international media as well. And wherever now the Pakistan is quoted these days, it is because of these floods. And World Health Organization sounds alarm on Pakistan when it says that it is, there's a warning of major outbreaks of diseases after the floods uh, wreck Hoak. So this is something which is an area of concern for all of us because because of the interruption in the health service delivery, there's a risk and there is not only a risk, but at the moment there's an outbreak of waterborne diseases. And the resultant outbreaks are because of many contributing factors. The first and most important one obviously is the damage to the entire infrastructure of the health, which is affecting the health service delivery system, but also there's disruption of the immunization services. In Pakistan, we have a door-to-door -door campaign for different kinds of immunization, which are part of extended program of immunization. So because of the damage to the excess roads and infrastructure, there is a major interruption in this delivery system. Then the people who have been displaced and, and they have been placed in the relief camps, there's no proper system to address and there is lack of facilities, so they are also suffering. Also, there is non-availability of portable water and because of, again, the damage to excess of roads, there's delayed medical supplies and there's lack of wash facilities which are aggravating these disease outbreaks. So whenever there is flood or whenever there is collection of water, there's always a risk of water and vector borne diseases. And these are the diseases which are most common in now resi residing in our country as well. And apart from these water and vector borne diseases, we are also having a rise in the newborn mortality because of the poor mother and child healthcare facilities and because of the females who are pregnant who are struck by this calamity. So when I talk about diseases related to water, they can be waterborne diseases like they, which are spread through water like cholera or typhoid or bacillary dysentery or diarrheal disease. And then there are water wash diseases like skin diseases, like scabies, like eye diseases, conjunctivitis, then trachomas, and then uh, flea and lice and tick bone diseases. They are also on the rise because of the water washed system. Then the water-based diseases, they are sometimes also reported, but now we've not been able to report this from our country at the moment. And the biggest threat and which is the major concern for all of us are the water-related vector bone diseases, which includes uh, in our part of the country, malaria and typhoid. So these are all that we are encountering these days and we need to have a plan in place to address them effectively. Coming on to the disease data, um, I'm not going to show you each and every figures because they are collective in different parts of the countries, some from uh, the provincial level, some from the flood affected areas. But what I can give you um, as a summary is that the number of cases of malaria and dengue, which are both waterborne diseases, have increased many fold as we compare them to the previous years. And there are also increasing number of skin diseases which are reported in the flood affected areas. And there is a reported surge in the typhoid, cholera, diarrhea, hepatitis A, leptospirosis, and also polio, which is also one of the biggest threats to our country. We are one of the two countries where the still polio is residing because of the interruption in the 
uh, polio workers, uh, access of the road to the areas, that we have seen a, a rise in the number of polio cases as well. And this is the disease of the data. If you, uh, you can see that we have a higher number in malaria cases because of this stagnant water of, and water collection because of floods. Similar is the case with other diseases like dengue. We are having an epidemic in almost all parts of the country and the flood affected areas are having a very, very bad epidemic with thousands of cases reported from different parts of these areas every day. Coming on to the other diseases like cholera, dysentery, um, um, fevers of other origin, chest infections, skin conditions, they are also on the rise as the data shows. So we have a system of reporting from different parts of the country on a provincial level, and they are then consolidated into a data. And the data is showing a number of cases of all these problems have considerably uh, increase in the past one month or so, which is post flood, if we compare them to the yester years. Uh, this is another uh, graph which is showing you a rise in the number of dysentery, acute watery diarrhea, and respiratory illnesses um, in Pakistan and different parts of the country. The malaria cases similarly are not only rising in flood affected areas of sin, but they are also rising. In, um, in Balochistan district, which is also one of the districts which is badly hit by uh, floods. And there is the high positivity ratio of malaria cases in these regions. Uh, this is also a Balochistan. We have like this data for age and gender wise in Balochistan as well. So coming on that what we need to do because of this climate change and downpouring and excess of rain and flooding, now comes the, the solution part. What can we do? So the first and foremost, according to me, is the allocation of resources and establishment of command and control system. And then to further decrease the risk of outbreaks, we, drain, we need to drain this flood water on an immediate basis and restore the displaced population into their place of origin. But obviously, uh, it's easy to say, but very, very difficult and very cumbersome to implement. But the government is trying on uh, its best, along with the Disaster Management Department, Irrigation Department, the CNW Department, and different NGOs and different world organizations, which are helping our uh, countrymen in, the, in this difficult times. And we are trying to mitigate these problems. Another mitigation strategy that we need to focus on is the public health measures because the infectious disease outbreak is the resultant of all these floods and calamities and the public health measures to prevent and control the communicable disease is the need of the hour. And then for improving the public health in general, we need to restore the damaged health related infrastructure and ensure the continuity of the supply and delivery of chain related to the medical facilities. Uh, we've also made an arrangement to mobilize the health workforce, uh, the doctors and paramedical staff and lady health visitors from areas which are not affected and we are hiring this staff from the market and through private sector and displacing them to the areas where they are badly needed these days. Another mitigation strategy is to involve the public in an awareness campaign, because I think this is the best way to, uh, to mobilize uh, people creating awareness about the threat of these infectious disease outbreaks and uh, and sensitizing people to you know seek healthcare facilities attention whenever they have any problem and to adopt uh, infection prevention and control measures. We're also working on restoration of our vaccination and EPI program and increasing uh, in the number of medical camps. We are offering medical camps and health facilities and in temporary arrangements to all the affected areas. But obviously, the number of medical camps are very less, and we need to increase them to have a better coverage of these areas. Another system uh, that we are very proud of, that we have an efficient, active surveillance system uh, for different types of diseases in the country. But now we have to establish an active surveillance system, particularly for these flood-affected districts as well. 
and provision of wash facilities in flood affected areas and because of the threat of the water borne vector borne diseases like malaria and dengue um, we need to have an ample supply of sprays of nets of mosquito repellents to save our countrymen from these deadly diseases and another last thing that we need to work and focus on is the safe drinking water and food for the disaster relief so there've been many organizations which are involved in providing safe drinking water and good safe food for these camps but i think these needs to be scaled up so i will just finish my talk over here by just giving you an overview what is the situation and how climate change can actually lead to a disastrous situation like one that we face and then ultimately leads to outbreak of different infectious diseases and out of these infectious diseases the neglected tropical diseases are of utmost importance thank you very much for your attention